Bank of America, going back to our story, has purchased Merrill Lynch, and the th- things have changed for them. What they hadn't realized, I guess no one had really thought about, the regulatory environment was going to have to change as a result of the financial crisis. So the financial uh, regulatory climate was completely different on from that weekend onward, which really sucked for Bank of America. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on air, but we're going to keep it in. <laughs> um, so now Bank of America is running into a few different things, right? So uh, the regulatory requirements have changed. Um, first and foremost, liquidity coverage ratio. Second, capital requirements. Third, believe it or not, their scale is working against them. And fourth, the vocal rule. So let's cover that in order. Do you want to start with the liquidity coverage ratio? Yeah, and, and and here's the issue. So Bank of America, you a bank wants to earn one percent on its assets. That's really what you need to earn in order for a bank to be able to create create value. Well, Bank of America is earning dramatically less than that. And so one of the reasons that it's earning so much less is because its balance sheet has to be much more liquid than a, a, a regional bank or or a much even a large bank like Wells Fargo, but a simpler bank because Wells Bank of America has both investment banking operations and retail banking operations. So if you think about what a bank is, really a bank is nothing more than a leveraged fund, right? You have some capital, you borrow a whole bunch of money for really cheap from depositors, and then you invest that money into higher yielding assets. Well, so the key is that if you can invest a larger chunk of that money into higher yielding, into really high yielding assets, and in the banking world, those are loans, then you're going to make a lot more money than a bank that's going to have to invest its money in, say, government securities, which only yield, you know, whatever it is, 2%, 2.5%. So if you look at Bank of America, one of the things that you'll notice is that only 41% of its earning assets consist of loans. Whereas if you go over and you look at Wells Fargo, 51% of its earning assets consist of loans. And so well, and how for much- for our listeners, just so you know, 10 percentage points might not seem like a lot. For example, if you got a 46 on a test and you raise it up to a 56, you're still failing. 10 percentage points can make all the difference in the world in financial terms. Yeah, 10% is a huge. And let me, let me give you some numbers to really back this up. So Bank of America has $1.8 trillion worth of earning assets, okay? So the difference between uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo in terms of the percentage of loans, or the percentage of their assets that are allocated to loans, equates to $11 billion in annual interest income for Bank of America. So that's just like basically free money that for all intents and purposes after falls to the bottom line after taxes are taken out of the, out of the equation. So the fact that it has to stay so much more liquid than Wells Fargo does is really impacting this bottom line. And the reason it has to stay so much more liquid is because of this thing called the liquidity coverage ratio. And the liquidity coverage ratio basically just tells banks how much cash or high quality assets they have to hold high on quality their balance sheet. Liquid assets. And for our listeners who are maybe new to investing or finance, okay. liquid means that they're easily converted into cash. And that- the reason that banks have to have such a high before before the financial crisis, banks had a much lower threshold for their liquidity coverage ratio because they that's, just did. No one had no one had to. That's right. And and what we learned in the financial crisis, and and we've seen this through multi, through financial crises, basically every financial crisis in the past, is that one of the main reasons that banks fail isn't necessarily because of, for a lack of capital. But it's for the lack of liquidity. So you have depositors that are running on a bank that want their cash very quickly. Well, a bank cannot, as a general rule, transition its assets from you know say loans, government securities over into cash fast enough to satisfy those runs. And so what the federal what the regulator saw was that look, we need to require the banks just at all times to hold more liquidity on their balance sheet. And the banks that have to hold the most are universal banks, the ones with trading operations, other types of Wall Street operations, and retail operations, because the projected, uh, because their liquidity coverage ratio is much higher, because the cash outflow under a projected scenario where, you know, you have like kind of a financial crisis, which is, they use the same kind of test that they use in the, in, in, during the capital, the, the CCAR process every year, which tests capital standards, is that they look at how much liquidity would flow out of a bank under a severely adverse economic scenario. And then that's how much a bank has to hold on its balance sheet um, at any one time. Right. And so if you think about it, a retail bank, which are banks that specialize in basically taking deposits and putting them back out again as loans, the the likelihood of them losing 
all of their capital because of a bank run is a lot less than people pulling out of the stock market, which is what could happen to a universal bank. Right, or even more, even more importantly, let's say you have you're a universal bank like Bank of America, and you have a prime brokerage, so you serve hedge funds, and hedge funds keep a lot of money on deposit with you in order to you know buy and sell securities as opportunities present themselves. Well, hedge funds, they are at the cutting edge in terms of knowing what's going on at Wall Street. As soon as they hear that there's a problem at a bank, they're going to pull all of their money out. So that's where that run really starts. Whereas retail deposits with people like you and me, we don't, well, I mean, we're you know, a little unique because we follow banks so closely, but the average person doesn't follow banks that closely. So they're not going to know when a bank gets into trouble immediately. So they're not going to run on the bank immediately and, and pull all that money out. So that's that difference between your Wall Street operations and your retail banking operations from the liquidity perspective.